Thank you, Los Angeles. Now, many of you already know this, but I am not a politician. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a problem solver. I've been trying to go around create jobs, creating jobs around the country. And I was doing that work in 2016 when Donald Trump became our president. Oh, it's cool. Some of you definitely voted for Donald Trump, and it's cool. Even though I'm in LA, I mean, like by the numbers, someone here voted for Donald Trump. It's like impossible. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's math. That's simple math. Yeah. So when he got elected, I took that as a giant stop sign. I was like, wait, stop the press. The country was so desperate that we elected a narcissist reality TV star as our president. And I said, OK, we have to stop and figure that out. So if you look at the mainstream media, you get a bunch of explanations for why he's our president today. Go ahead, shout out an explanation for why is Donald Trump our president today? Russia, that's, that's one for sure. What else? Yeah, the, the list goes something like Russia, Facebook, Hillary Clinton, FBI, racism. And there are all of these ideas that are packed in the mainstream media, but they ignore the truth in the numbers. And the numbers paint a very clear picture that we automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, Iowa, all the swing states he needed to win. And now we're going to do the same thing to jobs in retail, call centers, fast food, truck driving, and on and on through the economy. How many of you have noticed stores closing around where you live here in LA? And why are those stores closing? Amazon, Amazon that's right. It's the giant vacuum sucking up $20 billion in commerce every year. And malls and stores could survive that for a little while, but now they're closing. The black hole, the vacuum cleaner. Yeah, that's right. And how much did Amazon pay in federal taxes last year? That's right, they paid less in federal taxes than you all did, than each of us individually did. How messed up is that? Yeah. Very messed up. So then you look at it and you say, okay, how did a trillion dollar tech company pay zero in federal taxes? How is that even possible? And you have these accountants high-fiving each other, getting big bonuses. They're going to Jeff Bezos' office and being like, Jeff, we did it. Another year of zero taxes. And Jeff's like, fantastic. Here's a big truck full of money. And they were like, yes. And then they drove home. And then they took, you know, they took like baths in their like uh, vaults of gold coins, like Scrooge McDuck in those cartoons. And I'm going to say it is not their fault. They're doing their jobs. It is their job to minimize their tax burden. But it is our job to make sure they can't pay zero in taxes. Am I right, LA? Yeah. So Amazon's sucking up this value. They're paying zero in taxes, and we're all left holding the bag. <laughs> And this is what drove me to run for president. I was looking at these issues saying, wait a minute, it is not immigrants that are causing these problems around the country. Am I right? Yeah. It is technology. It is the fact that technology is pushing our economy to evolve to a point where now we have drones doing flybys and there's less and less need for human photographers. So these are the challenges of the 21st century. How many of you all work in technology? At least some of you do. So if you work in technology, you know what I'm talking about. You know that a lot of technology is simplifying things and speeding them up and making it so that people will have less to do later. And that is a, not a knock on the people who work in technology or had your hands up. You're doing your job. You're making things faster, meaner, leaner. But you know that there are other people on the receiving end of it. I have many friends in technology, and when I talk to them, I say, hey, you guys automating the jobs away? They say, yeah, yeah, I am. And then you say, how do you feel about it? And they, just like you, had your hands up. They're like, I don't feel good about it. And then say, would you like to distribute some of that value more quickly and broadly to the American people so that everyone can get along and like live a little better? And most of them say, hell yes. Because they're not bad people. They're just doing their jobs. We have to create a path that works for everyone. So I went to Washington, DC with this set of problems. I said, look, not immigrants. It's technology. AI is about to hit. 
in a way that's going to disrupt many, many Americans' livelihoods. And what are we going to do about it? Hello, this is Nice Wonder, and you're watching The Now Man Show, and I am here in Los Angeles with Andrew Yang, who is running for President of the United States on the Democratic Party ticket. Andrew, welcome to L.A. Um, it's great to be here. I just arrived today, but we got a rally of a few thousand people uh, revved up for a little bit later tonight. That's fantastic. Really looking forward to it. So I have a lot of questions for you, or as many as we have time for. I know that a lot of people out there, if they know about universal basic income, they find it very controversial, right? So just to, for the basics of it, for people who may not know what it is, can you give us a simple explanation? Sure. Universal basic income is a policy where everyone in a society, let's call it every American citizen, receives a certain amount of money to meet his or her basic needs, no questions asked. It's a right of citizenship. So under my plan, the Freedom Dividend, every American adult would start receiving $1,000 a month starting at age 18 every month until the day you die. So you know, a lot of people would ask you this question, I'm sure, but people want to know, how's that going to get paid for? Well, uh, the great thing is our economy is up to a record $20 trillion in GDP, uh, up $5 trillion in the last 12 years. And in terms of how to pay for it, if you look around at the big winners from artificial intelligence and new technologies, it's going to be Amazon, Google, Facebook, Uber. And Amazon literally paid zero in federal taxes last year. And Facebook did too, right? Um, I, I, I have to confirm that. Yeah. But I know Netflix paid zero. It would not surprise me if Facebook paid zero or close to zero. So... Uh, you have to ask yourself, is that their fault or our fault? And so when you ask, how do you pay for this universal basic income, if we put in a new tax to start harvesting the gains from all these innovations and new technologies, we can generate hundreds of billions, which combined with the economic activity from putting this money into people's hands, plus cost savings on things like incarceration and homelessness services and emergency room health care, plus the value gains from having a stronger, healthier, better educated, uh, mentally healthy and more productive population would be enough to pay for a dividend of $1,000 a month. The way I describe it is that uh, we have to start investing in our people. Companies do this all the time. They expect that they'll win. We have to do the same thing uh, for all citizens. And uh, a lot of people would wonder about to the cost of living, you know, because like in a city like Los, Los Angeles, it's very expensive here. So $1,000 might be okay for Iowa or West Virginia, but what about Los Angeles or Manhattan, for instance? Well, it's $1,000 a month on top of whatever you're currently making. So it would be a game changer for people in most parts of the country. Um, but it's true that it doesn't go as far in places like Los Angeles as it would in rural communities and places around the, the country. There is a trade-off involved because many people live in a place like New York because they're trying to access certain economic opportunities. Um, and the hope is that this $1,000 a month, it goes with you wherever you go. So it could help make... Uh, us much more dynamic, where people feel fixed in place because they need to be close to work, but maybe we could move around a little bit. And it could mean that people from rural communities take a shot at living someplace a little more expensive. I, I have a feeling a lot of people here in LA might be tempted to move someplace a little lower cost if they had $1,000 a month coming in. So it should fuel movement in both directions. So uh, the, a lot of people would also uh, question, you know, when you say uh, value added tax, they would say Ooh, tax. What is that exactly? Well, uh, again, if you look around at other countries, they've, they've figured out what we have not. So if you have your biggest tech companies, literally trillion dollar companies paying zero in federal taxes, it's partially because the income tax system is really easy to game. A company like Amazon or Netflix will say it just went through Ireland or uh, you know, it didn't happen here in the US. So what other countries have already done is they've already implemented a value added tax, which then means if you're benefiting from that marketplace, you have to pay into it. Uh, and that's the most foolproof way to make sure that the American people get a tiny slice of every Amazon purchase, every Google search, every robot truck mile, every Facebook ad, and on and on. Because, you know, one of our founding fathers, Thomas Paine, was a proponent of the citizen's dividend, is what he called, you know. And he was a radical. He was even considered a radical in his day. And I know a lot of people from all across the political spectrums, and their critique of that is everywhere from... Well, we've all heard the free money nonsense, you know, everybody just wants free money, just like Bernie, you know, free education, you know. And then I've also heard other criticisms as well, because, you know, people are concerned that, like, well, isn't that just like a, a form of reform? And as much as we all love the New Deal and everything like that, 
there's people who don't want to see the UBI plus go away because of, you know, we see how our system functions or dysfunctions. So people would be concerned that already have welfare or disability, uh, hopefully not Social Security would go away, you know, that they're concerned that, you know, well, in the transition of this new system, they might lose all of that, which would concern people. Because we have, as you know, lots of people homeless. More and more people are out in the streets. A lot of people have lost homes since 2008. They've lost careers, income, savings, even pensions, retirement savings. I can certainly relate to that. Um, I know millions of people that way. 40% can't afford basic necessities or a $500 emergency. And it's just going to get worse until we can do something. So how do you see, what do you think about a, a dividend that's based on like the commons? Like, for instance, the things that we all share together. For instance, the Internet, you know, intellectual property. When we do develop solar and wind and hydropower systems and even fossil fuels like the Permanent Fund in Alaska, what are your thoughts about the commons being part of that dividend? Well, that's in essence what, what uh, I'm proposing with the freedom dividend, which is what my version of universal basic income is. And if you think about this value-added tax, uh, it's essentially a tax on our common marketplace. Uh, and so the spirit is exactly identical to the petroleum fund that you describe and uh, carbon tax and dividend, which I'm for. Um, so the tricky part to me is that you can find something uh, and you put it in place of the natural resources to tax it. But um, like then the amount of money you're talking about is unclear to people. So I'm much rather just start at the end goal. It's very easy to understand a thousand dollars a month for every American adult. Uh, and then we can figure out what common resources um, that we need to uh, harness to get there. Yeah, and, and that's true. We can have, actually, you're, it's great that you're doing this to open up the discussion and, and get some movement on it because, you know, I have family in Switzerland, and I first learned about UBI that way from the referendum. Are you familiar with that from, like, 2015, yeah, yeah, 2016? Yeah, but, you know, they were asking for, I believe, something like 36000 a person uh, per year. But I want to say very clearly, uh, we can do more than just elevate the ideas. We can win the whole thing. I'm polling at 3% nationally right now, and most people have never heard of Andrew Yang, including a lot of people watching this video. Yeah. And Nate Silver, who uh, runs the leading political blog, 538, took a look at the fact that I'm polling at 3%. I've raised millions of dollars in increments of only $19. So we joke that my fans are even cheaper than Bernie's, yeah. where I have like over 100,000 donors now who've donated an average of only $19 online. And so uh, what Nate Silver said when he ran the numbers, he said, OK, Pulling at 3%, very low name recognition and low press exposure, uh, and has raised millions of dollars. According to these numbers, we can't discount the possibility that as more people find out about Andrew Yang, he just grows and grows and keeps growing and takes the whole thing. So the goal here is not to elevate ideas. The goal is to win. And if you look at the field, there is nothing stopping Andrew Yang from just climbing the ranks uh, because I'm already peeling off people who are – Trump supporters, libertarians, independents, conservatives, as well as Democrats and progressives. And socialists. And socialists. And so what we say is it's not left, it's not right, it's forward, where I'm the perfect candidate to beat Donald Trump because I'm getting people that uh, were attracted to his candidacy in 2016. And, you know, and a lot of people, you know, are when you get to that debate stage, by, by the way, congratulations. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I qualified for the Democratic uh, primary debates in June and July. Yeah, that's fantastic. So you, you have a, an opportunity to now talk about this in front of millions of people, literally. And there's going to be people, maybe even a billion, because people around the world will be watching it. All eyes are on the United States right now, it seems, for obvious reasons. But when you do get up there, uh, I've been asked, Dan, what do you think should be done about dividing the divide and conquer that our mainstream media is involved is separating us out giving us all kinds of titles by our ethnicities and our races our political preferences our uh, just you know our income you know our status and just separating us what are you going to do about that to bring us together even more well it's one reason my uh, candidacy is catching fire is that people can see that i'm laser focused on solving the problems on the ground that got donald trump elected uh, and just improving our lives and there's no um, no stone throwing here, no somehow castigating literally tens of millions of Americans who voted for a particular uh, candidate for a million different reasons. Uh, and so because I've got a highly pragmatic 
um, approach to solving problems on the ground. And you can go and see my website. I've got almost 100 policies just laid out for the world to see. Then people get very excited about me as someone who can build bridges and work with anyone. Fantastic. And uh, I know you got a busy schedule, so I want to ask you, um, I'm an advocate for worker cooperatives. I believe that the UK Labour Party's manifesto has democratized the economy, has some really good ideas in it about how to allow the workers to be owners, you know, the right of first uh, uh, refusal, you know, to actually buy a company out together as workers. Yeah. What do you think about that as a long-term solution going forward for our country? I think worker cooperatives are phenomenal, um, and the more of that sort of structure we have, the better off we'd be. That's one thing I, I love about the Freedom Dividend is that workers having that sort of ownership stake becomes much more realistic in an economy where people all are sharing in the rewards and have some resources to bring to the table, where the worker subsistence model is just going to get more and more punishing. And so we have to make owners out of everyone of this society. That's one reason why it's called the freedom dividend, because that's what owners receive when they own shares of a company. They receive a dividend, and we are the owners and shareholders of this country. We should get a dividend, and that would put more workers in position to become owners of various businesses. And the more we develop those kinds of businesses, like solar and wind and hydropower, I mean, it becomes obvious this is the commons that we all actually, we're building this wealth, this wealth that you were talking about. We all built together. You know, even if some people are out of work for a while, everybody contributed to this for decades or however long, you know what I mean? So we should be able to get something back, and the wealth should not, this great wealth that's been created should not be going all the, primarily to the top. It's something like 80% now. It was ridiculous. So we have to start taking those measures to go in that direction and make sure that, that I think the system needs to reorganize the structure so that wealth is distributed differently in the first place. Yes. Don't you agree? And, and the most effective way to do that is through something like universal basic income to build what I call the trickle-up economy yes. from people and families and communities up. Uh, and there are, frankly, relatively few paths to try and build that economy. Uh, and in my opinion, everyone's going to understand very quickly that the fastest, most direct and successful path there is going to involve just putting money into people's hands. It's like a lot of other politicians are trying to backtrack into it in various ways. It's like, oh, we're going to try and make this free. We're going to try and make that free. But uh, like the best way to make us all owners and beneficiaries is just to put money in our hands. Exactly. And we'll contribute to the economy. And the money's just going to get circulated over and over again through the economy. Um, and we're all going to win. Uh, for it. Like, even if you go to a room full of CEOs, which I have spoken to, and uh, they know that their businesses do better in an economy where people have money to spend. And we'll be able to help people that actually are in need, like, you know, the people in depression, people that are on, um, yeah. addicted to opioids and opiates, I'm sorry, opiates. And, and, and also, too, I'm an advocate for encouraging to people to be productive. And to be honest with you, I think most people actually want to be productive, okay. don't you? Yeah, uh, of course. And that's one of the things that studies have shown with uh, universal basic income is that work levels stay essentially the same. The only two groups that work less are new moms who spend more time with their kids and teenagers who graduate from high school at higher levels. So I don't think anyone's going to get mad at that. So I, I agree. If we have better measurements for our economy, uh, we can start solving the real problems of this age instead of fa uh, instead of this phantom GDP number, stock market uh, price growth that only advantages really the top fifth of the of the population, and this phantom. Uh, headline unemployment number, which is completely um, not indicative of where we are as a society right now. Yeah, definitely, there's because there's underemployed, there's low wage jobs with little or no benefits, there's temporary gigs and temporary jobs, and it's and, and all of that. And there's labor force participation, which right now uh, is at 63 percent, which is uh, near a multi decade low in the same levels as Ecuador and Costa Rica. So, you know, there, there are all these pain points that we all see and feel in the economy and then we're cheerleading these phantom numbers that paint a rosier picture that we all know uh, rings false. Thank you so much Andrew and like where can people find your website and uh, more about you? Yeah so if you go to yang2020.com uh, you can see all about our platform from Freedom Dividend to new measurements for the economy uh, or you can just google Andrew Yang. Uh, we joke that the Yang gang is very cheap to join. Uh, again like if you donated 20 bucks you'd be an above average Yang Gang member. Uh, and, and so uh, we're excited to take this message uh, around the country and the world. I'm going to be on the uh, Democratic primary debate stages in June and July. So you'll see me, see me in more and more places over time. 
That's fantastic. Can you say anything to the people that might be watching that only speak Taiwanese? Um, uh, 我是杨安子, 我在精选美国总统, but my um, Chinese is obviously quite poor. I got left back a few times in Chinese school. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrew. This is Nice Wonder with Andrew Yang on The Now Man Show. So that's number one, the freedom dividend. The second is we have to get health care off the backs of American families and workers. Am I right? Now, I have to say, you all look beautiful and sun-kissed and healthy because we're in Los Angeles. You look like you've spent exactly zero days with a doctor or in some kind of healthcare situation. But I have to say that healthcare right now is like the worst of all worlds for Americans, where we spend twice as much as other countries to worse results. And when we get sick or injured, we are much more stressed out about navigating our crazy system than we are actually getting well. And that's wrong in the richest, most advanced country in the history of the world. We can change it. We can have Medicare for all. And that's what I'm going to make happen as president. And when people ask, where are you going to get the money? I'm like, are you kidding me? We're spending 18% of GDP. We're plowing so much money into this dysfunctional system. We can get the prices down and the access up as long as we start rationalizing our crazy system. And I have a lot of friends who are doctors. I'm Asian, as you can tell. <laughs> but they know, too. They're like, yeah, it's true. Like, our system is a bit of a mess. And a lot of them, if you get a couple drinks in them, they're like, yeah, I'm for that, too. And the third thing is we have to, as Leslie was saying, we have to start measuring our economy in ways that matter to us. How many of you all woke up this morning excited about GDP? Yeah. How that guy was. That's funny. You know, how many of you woke up and were like, I'm going to make a big contribution to GDP today. I can feel it. GDP is something we made up almost 100 years ago. And even the inventor, Simon Kuznet, said three things. He said, number one, this is a terrible measurement for national well-being, and we should never use it as that. Number two, we should include parenthood and motherhood because it's so important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And number three, we shouldn't include military defense spending because it adds no economic value. Yeah. So of course we ignored all three of those things and now we're gonna ride GDP off a cliff. And I talk about my own family. My wife is at home with our two young boys right now, one of whom is autistic. How, how much does her work? Yeah, aut autism, yeah, thumbs up. I agree. And how much is her work valued at a GDP every day? How much does the market value her work at? And we all know that's perverse and messed up. We know that the work she's doing is more important and more vital, more challenging to our future than the work of the average corporate attorney or whatever nonsense. And I can say that because I was a corporate attorney for five months. And I can tell you that that job can be automated away very, very quickly. So those are the three big moves we need to make. A freedom dividend for all Americans of 1000 bucks a month. Yeah. Medicare for all to get the, the prices way down and the access up. Yeah. And then move towards measurements that would actually matter to us aside from this GDP thing we made up. So what would matter to us? How about mental health and freedom from substance abuse? Yeah. How about our own physical health and life expectancy? Yeah. How about how clean our air and water are? Yeah. How about our average income and affordability, whether we can afford rent? Yeah. So believe it or not, we can actually change our economic measurements to these things. And then I'm going to, I'm going to present them to you all at the State of the Union address every year. I'm going to have a PowerPoint deck. I'm going to be the first president to use PowerPoint for my State of the Union address. So this is the American scorecard. This is the human-centered capitalism that Leslie's talking about. PowerPoint. It's a new chant. That's right, America. They're chanting PowerPoint. And you'll actually get something out of the State of the Union that you f now find unwatchable. <laughs> Un unlike this bizarre theater performance we're all subject to. And then people are like all standing up and clapping in unison like they're trained seals. What the hell is going on? 
Instead, you'll get something out of it. You'll get real information and then some data on how we're going to improve things. When I talked about health and life expectancy, our life expectancy has declined for the last three years, the first time in 100 years. And why has our life expectancy started to decline? It's because eight Americans are dying of drugs every hour. It's because suicides have overtaken vehicle deaths as the leading cause of death for the first time in American history. And so we're worshiping this GDP number while our people are dying. And it makes no sense. I can't repeat that, but he's right. So if we had the right measurements, we could see how we're doing and we could make it better. And as president, I'm going to say, look, eight Americans dying of drugs every hour, that's horrifying and unacceptable. And we're going to get, down to, we're going to get it down by 50% in my first term. And here's how we're going to do it. And then I'll report back every year. What do you think? So this is the vision of the economy we have to get behind. We have to stop arguing about socialism, capitalism, this argument from the 20th century. I can guarantee you none of them saw artificial intelligence coming. And I like to quote my friend Eric Weinstein who said this. He said, we never knew that capitalism was going to get eaten by its son, technology. Yeah, they're, they're family. It's like capitalism, technology, and then technology is like Oedipus, like freaking killing his dad. So our politicians are literally fighting battles from the past. And some people call me a futurist. I say I'm a presentist. Am I right, Los Angeles? We can make the future, the present, like that if we come together. So this is the big plan. And I have to say that Donald Trump is our president today in part because he got a lot of the problems correct, where he ran, went around saying, we are suffering. And then what was the Democratic response in 2016? The Democratic response was, was nowhere not. It was actually, things are, things are great. And then, <laughs> and then Donald Trump becomes our president and we still can't confront the essential problems. I am laser focused on solving the problems that got Donald Trump elected. It is not left, it is not right, it is forward. And while Donald Trump's solutions were garbage and nonsense, it was like build the wall, turn the clock back, bring back the jobs, I'm saying we have to do the exact opposite. We have to move the clock forward. We have to accelerate our economy and society and I'm the man for the job because the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. That's right, Los Angeles. I'm going to beat that guy so bad, I can't wait. So I want your help with me right now to spell out for the rest of the country how we are going to beat Donald Trump in 2020. And it's because this campaign is getting people who voted for Donald Trump. A few of them here are kind of shy, it's cool. This campaign is getting libertarians. This campaign is getting independents. This campaign is getting people who did not give a crap about politics until just now. This campaign is getting Democrats. This campaign is getting hardcore socialists and liberals. Democrats are looking around being like, how are we going to beat Trump? How are we going to beat Trump? How about we roll out the candidate who's getting the people who voted Donald Trump into office in the first place? Am I right, Los Angeles? We are getting people from every part of the ideological spectrum because people are fed up with the same conversations and the same food fights that never lead anywhere. So right now, I mean, you all have caught on. You guys are our early Yang Yang adopters, and I love you for it. But people looked at the numbers, they broke it down, and people are asking, how are we going to win? Right now, I am polling at 3% nationwide. And that is before most people have ever heard of me. 
and a very smart guy named Nate Silver looked at the numbers. He did the math. And he said, wait a minute, Andrew Yang is polling at 3%. He's raised millions of dollars from everyday Americans just like you all. My average donation is only $19, so my fans are even cheaper than Bernie's. This is the cheapest gang to join you've ever seen. If you donate $20, you're an above average member of the Yang Gang. We also, we also, uh, if you leave the gang, we don't, we never know, and we, we just, you know, like it's, it's cool. It's not like a gang where it's like we find you. Uh, so this is a gang that's really, really, really easy to join. It's one reason we're growing and growing. And Nate Silver looked at the numbers. He said, "Wait a minute, Andrew Yang's polling at three percent. He's raising millions of dollars in increments of nineteen dollars, and his name recognition is lower than every other candidate's." And so Nate Silver said, we cannot discount the possibility that as more people find out about Andrew Yang, he just grows and grows and grows and takes out the whole field. That is the story that the numbers say. The numbers say that we are already only one of six candidates to qualify for the DNC primary debates in June and July by both polling and donations. And the media is looking around being like, who is this guy? And the American people are like, I know who that guy is, and that's my guy. That's our guy. Am I right, Los Angeles? So the rest of America is going to wake up. It's going to wake up to the fact that, wait a minute, he's talking sense. He's trying to solve the problems. And as people get behind this campaign, we're just going to grow and grow. What Nate Silver said is, no one knows what Andrew Yang's ceiling is. We, and I say, let's find out, right? Let's find out what our ceiling is. I've met a lot of the other candidates, the earnest patriots, but I, have to, I hate to say it, we kind of know what most of their ceiling is. We kind of know, we kind of know. This campaign, no one knows what our ceiling is. And I say, with your help, Los Angeles, we find out by 2020, what do you all think? We are going to make history together. We are going to shock the world. And we are going to leave a country we are yet proud of for our children. And we can look back and say, we stepped up. Yeah. That we saw the challenges, but we were, not, we were not too small for them. We actually grew. We rose to the occasion. That's right, brother. I think what he said was, build the foundation and rise to the occasion. What do we think? That's beautiful. So what we need from you all is we just need you all to initiate a couple of your friends into the Yang Gang. And all we want you to do is just send them your favorite interview, press hit, policy, it could be Joe Rogan. Give a shout out to Joe Rogan. It's true. After I'm in the after I'm in the White House, we're gonna do a special Joe Rogan experience from the White House. It's gonna be Joe Rogan Experience White House Edition with Andrew Yang. I'm gonna do it, and Joe's gonna look at me and be like, "Man, I can't believe we actually did it." And then I'm gonna say, "100%, brother. We totally did that thing." So this is the vision for our economy we have to build. We have to build a trickle-up economy from our people, our families, and our communities up. And that vision is going to take hold here in Los Angeles. It's going to go to Nevada. It's going to go to Iowa. It's going to go to South Carolina. Now, one thing that you may all not know, how many of you knew that California actually moved its primary date up this time? So the Democrats did you all a favor. The Democrats said, we're tired of the president being decided before California votes. And so they decided to move up to March. You all actually will be able to submit early votes around the same time that Iowa and New Hampshire start voting. How many of you knew that? 
So for the first time in decades, California is going to help choose the next president of the United States. Are you up for that, Los Angeles? And with your help, we can light the, we can light the country on fire with the vision of an economy that works for us. We're going to make history together in 2020. Thank you all very much, Los Angeles. I love you all. Thank you. The past is gone. Said and done, I wanna know I did the right thing. Who had